just past 7.30, so why don't, why don't we get started? Thank you again for joining us for Grand Rounds this morning. It's a pleasure this morning to have Dr. Torani from SickKids join us. She's been a staple in the pediatric ophthalmology community in Toronto uh, for well over a decade now, uh, but I will give her a full introduction nonetheless. Dr. Torani um, initially completed her, her medical training at the University of Wales, um, and subsequently her ophthalmology training at Cardiff and Liverpool and Birmingham in the UK. And Follow that up with a pediatric ophthalmology fellowship at the Princess of Wales Hospital in Birmingham, after which she did a second pediatric ophthalmology fellowship here at Toronto uh, at the Hospital for Sick Children. She also simultaneously completed a master's degree in health policy, healthcare policy and management during her residency and following her fellowship was recruited back to the University of Toronto, uh, where it's been a real pleasure for our department to, um, to train with her. Uh, Dr. Tarani has a special interest in the management of diseases of the anterior segment, including cataract, glaucoma, and uveitis in childhood, um, and her expertise is in both medical and surgical treatment of these cases. So we look forward to her, chat, her, her, her talk this morning and an update on pediatric ophthalmology. So Dr. Tarani, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. And I welcome uh, Brian and Sonia as well, our resident presenters. Thanks very much, Hamandeep. Um, I'm going to take my mask off. Sorry. My, my voice is doing a little bit better, but I've been quite oh. sick for the past few weeks, so I'm not going to talk at uh, rounds. I'm going to allow the people who are more likely to be able to complete the task, uh, Sonia and Brian. Um, I've got a bit of teaching afterwards, so uh, I hopefully can keep my voice for that. So this morning, we've got a couple of cases for you, and I'm really grateful to people who helped with these cases as well. Um, so trying to kind of bring to light for you a um, kind of complex uveitis case, which presented with very poor vision and has actually done very well um, <clears throat> with the help of several of our colleagues. Um, and uh, Sonia is going to go through that and she's got a sort of longer case. Brian has a shorter case, which is seems fairly mundane, but I thought it was important to stress some of the basic things that you should keep in mind. So um, thank you very much. Amandeep, it's actually been almost two decades now that I've been here, which is a long time, but uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed doing pediatric ophthalmology and we're always thinking about recruiting new people to join us so that we want our department to grow. Um, I'm saying that because Asim sitting there, I know he's always looking for this. I want to plug the fact that pediatric ophthalmology is enjoyable and um, I hope that more people join us. So Sonia, take it away, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tarani. Um, so I'm gonna be starting with uh, our first case, uh, just by way of introduction. I'm Sonia, I'm one of the PGY3s here at U of T. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Crystal Chung and of course, Dr. Tarani for their help and guidance in uh, the making of this presentation. So my presentation is titled, Silicone Oil, Friend or Foe? So let's start with a clinical presentation. Um, this case is a new referral to the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, and it was a referral for blurry vision of the right eye for five months. Um, on history, the patient uh, is a 12 year old boy, he's healthy. And he's had bilateral cataracts that have been followed by local eye care providers, um, but no surgery was ever offered. The reason he was referred to sick kids is because he moved to Toronto and was hoping to um, have a long-term ophthalmologist. Prior to that, he was seeing different lo local eye care providers and was being kind of um, seen as he was moving around. Um, no past medical history. He takes no medications. He has no allergies. And his family history is only notable for psoriasis uh, in his mother. So on examination, his vision was 2400 in the right eye with no improvement uh, with pinhole and 2030 in the left eye. His intraocular pressure was four in the right eye and 24 in the left. Uh, his pupils were equal around reactive to light. There was no RPD. And slit lamp exam was notable for bilateral fine KPs inferiorly. He had a two plus cell uh, reaction in the right eye, a one plus cell uh, inflammatory reaction in the left eye no posterior sinique, and he had bilateral posterior subcapsular cataracts. The right eye was far uh, more significant than the left. So in terms of his dilated fundus exam, uh, there was no view of the fundus in the right eye. And in the left eye, um, the view was much better, and we could see a supratemporal and temporal MAC on RD in the left eye. And on 
360 scleral depressed exam, no retinal breaks or tears uh, were noted. So this is the B scan of the right eye with, with no view. Uh, you can see a total Mac off RD. And here in the left eye, you can see that the patient has a temporal and supratemporal um, fovea on RD that's slowly tracking towards the macula. And again, uh, this was uh, this was established as an exudative retinal detachment uh, because of shifting fluid and the fact that there were no breaks or tears noted on scleral depressed exam. So on review of systems, the child informs us that as he rubs his eyes, hairs fall out of his eyebrows, and he's been noticing some bald patches there. But the review system was otherwise unremarkable. He has no history of trauma to the eye, uh, no infectious uh, risk factors or symptoms, and no uh, travel outside of Canada. So at this point, um, I'm hoping for a resident to tell us what they think the differential diagnosis may be and what they think the leading diagnosis would be in this case. Anyone can volunteer. <laughs> so, you see have like uveitic things if you're having these review of system slides. So, and is it also a child at this age with probably no other factors that would presuppose just a simple retinal detachment if you can't find any breaks? Um, like maybe like something like CSR, but it's not involved with phobia, so it's a bit also very young for that. Things like that can cause just subretinal fluid. I'm just thinking like basilar detachments like uh, scleothalmia BKH. I don't know if you're trying for the SO, but maybe BKH for that age. Um, like you can also think of other inflammatory things like posterior scleritis. We see a lot of sick kids or kind of infiltrative cause like leukemia lymphoma, keeping it broad, infections, syphilis can cause everything. So maybe this, I don't know. Um, that's fun. No, that's excellent. So um, uh, very broad differential that is mainly inflammatory conditions. You also have to consider infectious etiologies. Uh, BKH, especially in this case, um, is, is high on the clinical, um, on the differential diagnosis. Um, so in light of that, um, a few consultations were made at the hospital for sick children. Uh, we ruled out infectious etiologies. We reviewed the blood work and uh, the workup with hematology oncology to make sure that there were no signs of uh, systemic lymphoma or leukemia in this patient. He was otherwise very well. Um, and the case was also discussed with the Sunnybrook retina team to ensure that there was no intraocular lymphoma uh, on any of his ancillary testing. And of course, that was ruled out as well. Um, so in this child, to summarize the case so far, he's a 12-year-old boy. He's otherwise healthy. He has no history of eye trauma, no history of um, previous eye surgery. He has bilateral chronic anterior uveitis, alopecia, and exudative retinal detachments in both eyes. So he definitely meets the criteria for VKH. And that was uh, the way we, we started treating him. So in terms of initial management, um, then he first had a TB skin test, which was negative, and then started on high dose oral steroids uh, at one milligram per kilogram, and he was continued on topical therapy as well. Because the leading diagnosis was VKH, an MRI brain in orbit was also uh, pursued to rule out any kind of leptomeningeal, leptomeningeal involvement, um, and we were able to rule out any leptomeningeal enhancement on MRI. There was also no intraocular mass uh, noted in the MRI orbit, and the report essentially favored a diagnosis of pan -uveitis. So the patient, as I had mentioned, was started on um, high-dose oral steroids, but unfortunately, despite high-dose steroids, his MAC-on RD progressed to a MAC-off RD in the left eye. So he was admitted to the hospital, and IV methylprednisolone was started at one grams uh, for three days. He was then started on a higher dose of oral prednis prednisone at 1.5 milligrams uh, per kilogram per day. And despite this high dose of prednisone, his um, clinical picture was fairly stable. So at that point, uh, Remicade infusions were also started. Uh, just so for context, he was on high dose prednisone up until October with a slow taper. Despite all of this immunosuppression, the patient still had poor vision and still had bilateral MAC-OFF RDs. Uh, so in, at this point, vitroretinal uh, surgery was consulted, and the following procedures were uh, performed by uh, the VR team. Uh, he had a parse plane of vitrectomy and silicone oil insertion in both eyes, uh, first the right eye and then the left eye a few months later. And to address the his cataract, he had a right lensectomy 
performed in the right eye. Post-operatively for the right eye, um, the, the surgery went well, there were no complications. And at his first po post-op visit, his vision was hand motions in the right eye. Uh, now it was 2,400 in the left because there was a Mac off RD. And his pressures were 26 up from four when he first presented uh, and 14, uh, 14 in the left eye. His slit lamp exam uh, was fairly um, benign. Uh, he had some trace cell, some capsular fibrosis in the right eye, and his retina was finally flat after many months of having uh, a MAC off RD. Postoperatively in his left eye, he had a similar successful uh, retinal surgery. There were no complications. At uh, the first postoperative visit, his vision was 2250 in the left eye. His anterior segment exam was fairly unremarkable. His retina was flat on um, dilated fundus exam, but the main issue at this point was his pressures. In the right eye, his IOP was 35, and in the left eye, his IOP was 50. And it was noted that his right disc had started to appear somewhat pale. And you can see here that these measurements were repeatedly um, high and consistently in the same kind of ballpark, so this had become uh, a next issue. And for context, his angle was open in both eyes. So of course the patient was started on max topical therapy and Diamox, uh, but despite this, his pressures remained um, uncontrolled. So this is his OCT. Um, when he first presented, his cup to disc ratio was uh, 0.3 for context. And at this point it had increased uh, to 0.7 roughly. And uh, the, um, the right cup had started to appear pale as well. So of course, surgical interventions were warranted and the patient underwent uh, a few other surgeries, namely silicone oil removal in the right eye and then the left, GAT in both eyes, and an omid valve in the right eye. All of this to adequately control his uh, intraocular pressure. And this is um, our patient at his last visit at the Hospital for Ch uh, Sick Children. Uh, remarkably, his vision had improved to 2050 in both eyes. His IOP is now well controlled at 17 in the right eye and 15 in the left. His tube is in place. And though his nerve is uh, pale in the right eye and cupped in both, his retina is flat and he's functioning very well. Um, so he has improved remarkably over the course of his um, stay here. Now a review of VKH. Uh, so VKH is named as such uh, for the following historical context. In 1906, uh, Vogue uh, and in 1921, Koyanagi both independently reported the same disease uh, characterized by a constellation of disparate symptoms, namely anterior uveitis, alopecia, vitiligo, dysacusis. It was unclear why this clinical picture kind of uh, came about, but they reported it nonetheless. A few years later, in 1921, Harada also described an unusual case of bilateral exudative retinal detachments with posterior uveitis, but this time it was also accompanied by pleocytosis of the CSF, uh, again published in the literature. And it was only a few years later, in 1932, that uh, Babel coined the term VKH uh, when it was established that actually all of those presentations were part of the same spectrum of disease. And um, now, now we have this disease entity called VKH. So we reviewed the diagnostic criteria, but just to be um, kind of a bit formal about it, uh, there are four diagnostic criteria that need to be established uh, to meet the, the to meet uh, the criteria for VKH. So the first is no history of trauma or surgery, and then you need three of the following four categories: you need bilateral chronic anterior uveitis, uh, posterior uveitis, any kind of neurological sign, including tinnitus, meningismus, or any kind of cranial neur uh, neuropathy. And uh, you need uh, cutaneous signs, including alopecia, as was the case uh, in our uh, child. And like uh, Austin very elegantly went through, uh, the differential diagnosis is very broad and includes um, SO, lymphoma, uh, leukemia, sarcoid, cat scratch disease, posterior scleritis, and many more. So the treatment for VKH um, is pretty uh, uh, well established. In the acute phase, patients need to receive high dose corticosteroids, uh, typically IV high dose corticosteroids for three days, as was the case in, in, in the presentation um, that we're going over here. And it has to be for a minimum, of a, a minimum of at least six months with a slow taper. 
And the, liter the literature has shown that early withdrawal of corticosteroids is associated with an increased risk of recurrence and worse visual prognosis. And if you provide the patient with low dose prednisone, prednisone or prednisolone, um, that also has uh, higher incidence of recurrence and more frequent episodes. So really the patients should be on high doses for at least six months to optimize their visual prognosis if it is medically possible for them. And in cases of recurrence of VKH, often systemic corticosteroids are insufficient. And in that case, um, immunomodulatory agents and biologics uh, are often used as well. In our case, given the severity of his symptoms and the, um, his visual uh, status, immunomodulatory medication started from the, from the beginning. So approximately 51% of eyes with VKH will unfortunately develop at least one complication. Uh, the ones highlighted in yellow are the ones that are, are patient uh, sustained cataracts, glaucoma, posterior synechiae, serous retinal detachments, but you can also develop choroidal neovascularization, subretinal fibrosis, choroidal atrophy, and optic atrophy. To now switch, uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about silicone oil. Um, silicone oil is a molecule that consists of repeating units of siloxane. And siloxane is essentially just an oxygen silicone backbone that can have two additional bonds on each side that different organic or inorganic um, side chains can be attached to. And depending on the side chains, you'll have different types of silicone oil. The most common type of silicone oil that's used in retina is one type is one called PDMS, and it has two methyl side chains attached to it. And uh, PDMS has a specific gravity that's lighter than water. The indications for silicone oil are fairly broad. Uh, the one indica our indication was, of course, a complicated pediatric retinal detachment, but there's a variety of different um, retinopathy that um, warrants the use of silicone oil. Why use silicone oil in general rather than a long acting gas? In children, the answer is fairly obvious. Um, children have a hard time with adequate positioning. Um, and so using a, an oil that doesn't require strict prone positioning uh, is of great utility in this, pop this particular uh, patient population. But more broadly, uh, silicone oil has earlier visual rehabilitation. There is no restriction to air travel. And of course, it's a lot more comfortable postoperatively uh, because there's no uh, similar positioning requirements. The question that's challenging with silicone oil is when do you remove it? Um, in the silicone study, uh, silicone oil was only uh, allowed for a minimum of eight weeks. And it was generally recommended that patients had um, the silicone oil removed after six months postoperatively. But the general consensus is it should be removed when the silicone oil has served its purpose as a tamponading agent and when any further retention increases the risk of complications. So it's always a risk benefit calculus. And in certain particular cases, um, permanent silicone oil tamponade is actually a good idea, uh, namely in patients with low or no visual prognosis who uh, have a, ri a high risk of development of thysis. As I was alluding to, uh, silicone oil is not a completely benign uh, substance. It, it can have adverse outcomes in the eyes if left for too long or in the wrong patient uh, population. Um, silicone oil can migrate into the anterior chamber. It can cause glaucoma as uh, presented today. It can uh, precipitate the development of cataracts. It can unfortunately not successfully reattach the retina and recurrent retinal detachments can occur. It can also cause emulsification, keratopathy, and in some instances, even with a perfectly flat retina, there can be a phenomenon uh, of unexplained visual loss after silicone oil tamponade. To discuss the glaucoma aspect of this, um, in the silicone study, 8% of cases that underwent silicone oil tamponade actually experienced glaucoma at the 36 month follow-up. And there are a variety of different reasons that this can occur. Uh, IOP spikes after surgery in, with silicone oil can essentially be assessed in a variety of different ways. There's pupil block glaucoma, especially in instances where an inferior iridectomy was not performed. Uh, it can be caused by overfill of the oil in the eye. It can be also caused by secondary open angle glaucoma, migration of the oil into the anterior chamber, and secondary angle closure glaucoma um, due to the mechanical blockage of the trabecular meshwork or trabeculitis induced by the emulsified uh, silicone oil. 
And it's important to recognize that if the intraocular pressure continues to rise despite max topical and medical therapy, uh, glaucoma surgery needs to be performed. And because of the silicone oil involving occasionally the conjunctiva, uh, there's a higher risk of conjunctival fibrosis. So it's best to avoid a trabeculectomy when possible and to favor a drainage device um, in those instances. So not to get back to our initial question, silicone oil, friend or foe, the answer is most appropriately yes and. Uh, in, our, in, in our case, our patient presented with very poor vision, chronic bilateral exudative retinal detachments. And if it were not for the silicone oil, we would not have been able to reach a vision of 2050 um, by the end. So the silicone oil served its purpose as a tamponading agent. It allowed us to essentially succeed at uh, flattening the retina. But it did, unfortunately, make the management of the patient's glaucoma particularly challenging. Um, this was not so much uh, an issue when the patient first presented and was hypotenuse, but as his retina flattened and his ciliary body shut down was resolving, we could see that um, the IOP became very difficult to manage intra uh, postoperatively and required further surgical interventions, namely the Ahmed tube and the GAT uh, to uh, control his pressures. Um, so in terms of our take-home points, uh, the diagnosis of VKH requires very thorough clinical history and requires a very thorough review system and examination. Silicone oil has an important role in the management of complex pediatric retinal detachments, and careful consideration should be taken when deciding the appropriate time of silicone oil removal. And always consider the risk of conjunctival fibrosis when managing glaucoma in eyes with silicone oil. So these are my references. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. That was, that was fantastic. There's a couple of questions for you. Um, the first was just about demographics. Do you what were the patient's demographics? And uh, I guess that alludes to the fact that there are certain certain uh, ethnicities that are higher risk for BKH. I don't know if so, you have information. Who's Middle Eastern, right? Um, Asian. Yeah. yeah. He was Asian. Yeah, that is fitting. Um, Dr. Maris Kandari is asking, was there an IVFA in the early days before the retinal detachment progressed? I think that's when, the, I think that's when uh, Crystal Chung was um, uh, taking care of the patient initially, because I actually took over once she went on maternity leave on this patient. And so I don't, recall a fluorescein angiogram uh, being performed. I don't know. When the patient first presented, he did not have an IVFA. He did at a later, at later follow-ups, yeah. yeah. Not and, 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 and for those of us who haven't seen VKH since our residency, remind us what we're looking for in IVFA uh, in the setting of VKH. Sorry, Scott. Sorry. Sorry. Starry sky appearance. Okay, so we've got starry sky appearance. That's right. Um, one more question: the silicone oil is 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 it the is the risk factor for glaucoma just the fact that you've had silicone oil or the persistent silicone oil? So when we say eight percent of eyes at thirty six months, um, does that include eyes who have already had silicone oil removed? Or are those the or those the eyes that still have silicone oil in the eye at 36 months? So this was patients who had the insertion. Unfortunately, the literature shows that even if you remove the silicone oil, the IOP can remain high. So once you've had the silicone oil, you're kind of at a higher risk, even if it's removed, which is why a lot of patients need further surgical intervention, oftentimes twos. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think the source. That was a great presentation, Sonia, a great summary of this <clears throat> complex patient. You know, it's pretty rare that patients with VKH will need surgery. Um, you know, most of the time, uh, you know, the uh, the steroids and the Im immunosuppressives will get rid of their retinal detachment. I, I, you know, there was some delay, I think, between the onset of his symptoms and the, you know, starting of his systemic steroid therapy, and that probably contributed to his persistent retinal detachment. I mean, I, you know, I don't think silicone is the, is the only source of his high pressure. He was a steroid responder. Um, you know, usually silicone long-term, you get emulsified silicone oil bubbles. He didn't have a ton of emulsified silicone. So I think his glaucoma, 
you know, was multifactorial, certainly his uveitis and the steroids um, contributed importantly, I think, to his high pressure. I mean, as the, as the retina team that you alluded to, um, who took care of this patient, um, he, um, you know, he had, he had a, he had a complex, uh, he had a complex course. And despite his, his super high pressures over a long time, his nerve looked remarkably, I mean, it, it wasn't perfect, but it looked remarkably good, um, even in the latter stages of, um, of his disease. And, you know, the fear with somebody like this, you know, when you're, when you're doing a vitrectomy with silicone oil, the fear is always that when you take the silicone oil out, he's going to redetach. I mean, you talked about the indications for long-term silicone, you know, the biggest fear is redetachment. So, um, cause there's about a 15 in, you know, in normal kind of complex retinal detachments, the risk of redetachment is about 15%. But, you know, this is sort of uncharted territory. It's pretty rare that we end up doing vitrectomy with silicone for VKH. So thanks very much, Peter, because that's uh, that's very useful. What I wanted to come out here was actually to speak to the fact that patients with this disease are very likely to develop glaucoma. So it's a little bit tongue in cheek. We're saying is silicone oil friend or foe? It's definitely a friend in his case, in addition to... Um, the immunosuppression. So I, I'm not quite sure what happened when this kid was seen originally. He, someone had diagnosed that he had cataract, but nobody had spotted the fact that he'd had an exudative retinal detachment or some anterior uveitis. So that's the first point. If you see cataracts in a child, you should really think, why do they have cataracts? And think about um, what's, what's the underlying problem. It's not uncommon for us to see children present with cataracts as a, um, with presenting mild uveitis that gets missed. It's not uncommon for us to see cataracts in children as a presenting sign of diabetes. And if you don't actually ask the question, do you drink more than normal? Are you going to pass water more than normal? You're not going to find that um, diagnosis, but you won't think of it. So first of all, think about the fact that if a child comes with cataract, you've got to look very carefully why they have it. Secondly, this kid came in with hypotony as a result of the ciliary shutdown. The exudative detachment and probably ciliary body detachment at the time caused, and, and ciliary body shutdown, had caused a presentation with, high, with low pressure. Once you start treating these kids, which this child was actually treated very appropriately, very aggressively, um, the, the eye can then recover and the pressure can go up. Actually, the pressure started going up once because in spite of all the suppression, the exudative retinal detachment hadn't cleared. That there was such a distance, I don't think the RPE could actually pump out that fluid. So it took a physical tamponade with silicon oil to get rid of that fluid. And once that happened, the pressure goes up. So these are things to keep in mind when you're managing these patients. There is a challenge that we have, in, and Sonia was really good at being able to track down the records in Sunnybrook. And we found that we, you know, that he, was, he was being put on medication. He'd go to Sunnybrook, and sometimes they'd be reported that the pressure was normal. His, medication was discontinued. So actually having patients maybe in one center and managed can sometimes help because you can have the different people take care of all different um, segments of the child care in one place and with the records available for everyone to see. Um, but one, once you do have silicone oil in the eye, it makes things particularly difficult. He, the fact that this was in the right eye, a unicameral eye with, with silicone oil in, meant that any sort of glaucoma surgery that you wanted to do involved perhaps removing the silicone oil. And we took the plunge. We decided to take it out to make it possible for us to see one, making sure there's no overfill of the silicone oil, which clinically did not look like it. And also to then be able to manage, because if you put in a, if you try to do any sort of surgery and silicone oils in the eye, it's a nightmare. Um, if you try to put a tube in, it's all just gonna come out and go under the, um, the conjunctiva, and it's going to cause significant fibrosis. 
So these are all things that we had to deal with in this case, um, but managed to um, navigate through it quite well. In the left eye, the child was actually left baking. The lens opacity was not removed at the same time as putting silicon oil. And that made things a lot easier because you could then go on and do glaucoma surgery, followed by cataract surgery in the left eye. And that was an easier path to navigate. So a lot of things, um, and I'm really grateful to the help uh, through Retina Service and um, our rheumatology colleagues in being able to allow us to manage this case really well um, with high doses of immunosuppression. And one of the other things is you, you do actually have the facility when you have these patients come in to get them admitted, give them pulse steroids like this child was given and followed up with very high doses. Um, and you can normally give the infliximab as sort of every four weeks, but we actually went up to every two weeks. And we also have the opportunity to increase the dosage to 20 milligrams per kilogram if you want to, to see if you get any re resolution. In spite of everything that we tried, we actually had to go to surgical intervention to, um, for him to resolve. And he's actually, now done remarkably well. We tried to taper him off as infliximab to every three weeks, and we've got recurrence of some macular edema, so it's promptly put back on. So this, this child's gonna be on long-term immunosuppression. This is not somebody you're gonna be able to take off uh, anytime soon. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Um, wonderful case, by the way. I think this is an amazing outcome for this patient. Like, you know, these young patients, there's so much at stake for them. I do think Dr. Mirz Kandari has a comment or a question. Um, yeah, so thank you. I just wanted to say you had a difficult case to deal with, so it's so great work. But I just want to repeat what you said, Nasrin, about the index of suspicion. Um, just so that nobody thinks that it's always doom and gloom, you catch these kids very early. They do extremely well. Um, and I, I suspect this was, as uh, somebody mentioned, chronically going on for a long time. But um, I, I just quickly looked, and we presented the case about 10 years ago or so on, on, on the Doves round. And sort of 10 years later, the kid uh, just has um, um, sort of amazing results. And, you know, once they present within that first week, with that first little bit of exudate at the uh, at the fovea or, or just para, um, parafoveal, um, you catch them extremely early and they do very well. And the recurrences in the long term are just relatively mild anterior uveitis. So don't, they don't really necessarily have the, um, the, the posterior segment disease when they have a, a recurrence. So they actually end up doing really well. Um, so just want to emphasize what Nazarene said is that there's got to be an index of suspicion. If something doesn't make sense, you've got to chase it up. And, um, and, 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 and they sort of fortunately do well. I just wanted to just share that it doesn't have to be doom and gloom for VKH kids because they can do really well. Thanks. And that kind of goes to the comment that Ellie McCanns from the U UK uh, mentioned something similar. And I know this patient came to presentation late because they were elsewhere prior to coming to Toronto, but um, just a comment that this could have been a chronic, re chronic recurrent case of VKH um, given the history of PSC under observation. So uh, just speaking to that point and being, and being vigilant for early diagnosis. Uh, I think just in the interest of time, we should move on to Brian's presentation, but Sonia, that, that was fantastic. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Brian. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sonia. That was a great presentation. Uh, can you see the screen okay here? Yeah, looks good. Okay. So good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Wong, and I'm a second-year ophthalmology resident at U of T. Uh, sorry that I couldn't make it uh, to join everyone in person today, uh, but I'm excited to talk to you about a case of trauma in a pediatric patient today and how technology was used to manage this case successfully. On this case, I've worked with the guidance of my co-resident, Dr. Sonia Anshush, and my supervisor, Dr. Nasrin Tarani at SickKids. So our objectives for this talk today are to discuss the imaging modalities that help with the diagnosis and management of ocular trauma in children, to discuss the approach to traumatic eye injuries in pediatric patients, and to consider possible reasons for residual reduced vision after trauma. 
So our case is an eight-year-old boy referred to sick kids from an outside hospital for examination under anesthesia and repair of a penetrating globe injury. He was poked in the right eye by a wooden stick one day ago, and there was concern for a corneal laceration or globe rupture. When he first came in, he had a painful red eye and was nauseous, but there was no other facial, head, or body trauma that was sustained. He had no other ocular or medical history, and of note, him and his family were actually recent immigrants to Canada, and he just presented with his older brother. His pupils were round. Uh, uh, on examination, uh, his vision was uh, 2063 in the right eye, and that was the eye that was injured with no improvement on pinhole. His left eye vision was 2080 with improvement to 2050 on pinhole. His eye pressures were normal at nine in the right eye and eight in the left eye, and his pupils were round, reactive, and not peaked. So these are the slit lamp pictures of the eye. Uh, can anybody tell me what they see here? Uh, maybe a PGY2? Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't uh, quite hear the audio there, but yeah, it was a laceration in the. <laughs> in the so the so the pictures are a little bit blurry because that sort of speaks to the fact that it's sometimes difficult to image a child that's coming in with uh, what's obviously a painful eye. <laughs> Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, so it, it's, uh, yeah, as you can see uh, with the uh, top half of the lid there, um, the child was quite photophobic uh, in uh, when these pictures were taken. So sometimes these cases can be quite difficult to examine and it takes a lot of pictures of. So uh, there's a laceration in the inferior cornea. I'll, I'll use a laser pointer uh, to show you guys. So here there's a laceration in the inferior cornea uh, with surrounding corneal edema, uh, conjunctival injection, and a hypopian as well. You can see the hypopian a little better um, in this picture on the right. And these were the rest of the exam findings. So what wasn't as obvious in uh, those two pictures was that uh, there was also uh, a severe anterior chamber reaction with four plus cells, a 360 posterior synechia, and a fibrin membrane over the lens. So in these trauma cases, uh, it's important to carefully examine the integrity of the SMA's membrane and to look for any signs of trauma to the iris and the posterior lens capsule. A Seidel test should be performed uh, by painting the surface with a, uh, the ocular surface with fluorescein strips to look for any aqueous leakage. Now, in this case, the cornea was Seidel negative and the anterior chamber was deep. But we wanted to be more confident that there wasn't a full thickness corneal perforation or a globe rupture. Uh, sometimes examining to see if the decimase can be, has been breached can be hard, especially in a child or a patient who's less cooperative on exam. So here's what we did. The resident who saw him on, on call that evening took anterior segment OCT scans to get a better idea of the decimase membrane. And the, these were the scans that were taken, and these are cuts uh, through the inferior cornea. And as you can see in the posterior cornea here, it showed that the decimase membrane is intact and not disrupted, which supported that this was a partial uh, thickness corneal laceration. And so you can see that the laceration site in the top scan is right here, and it goes to mid stroma. And then uh, it goes to stroma here as well. And you can see some swelling, corneal edema, and heaping of the epithelium. So let's talk more about the role of anterior segment OCT in trauma. Uh, as we know, uh, anterior segment OCT uses near infrared light to obtain high resolution scans of the cornea, iris, anterior lens, and sclera. And this is especially useful in uh, children who can be very photophobic sometimes, making the exam hard uh, unless they're put under anesthesia. It's a helpful adjunctive test to assess the depth of a penetrating object or laceration into the cornea. And this has value given that foreign bodies can pose a risk of infection, inflammation, and other vision-threatening complications. In our case, we used it to assess the integrity of the decimase to ensure there was no globe rupture. And some groups have also published uh, small case studies using anterior segment OCT in corneal injuries and intracorneal foreign bodies, and I've listed them in the references here. 
So we can talk more about the advantages of anterior segment OCT and trauma. Uh, one is that they're non-invasive. It can be used to assess the size and the depth of corneal injury and other aspects of eye trauma without applying pressure to the globe, like you would with a B scan or gonioscopy. And this can be helpful if a clinician is concerned about a possible globe rupture. It's also able to image a variety of materials, including metals, glass, and organic or vegetative objects. And this has advantages over a CT or a plain film x-ray, which sometimes doesn't image the organic material well. Plus, OCT doesn't come with the radiation risk that plain film x-ray or CT has. And by localizing foreign bodies and the angle of their penetration, anterior segment OCT can also help the clinician decide on the optimal method of removing the foreign body to reduce damage and minimize the scar formation that um, can happen. For example, if, if you were confident with anterior segment OCT that um, a foreign body was uh, intraepithelial, you could use a burr uh, to kind of brush it off of there versus using a grasping forceps for a deeper stromal foreign bodies. And like we talked about earlier, it's also valuable in diagnosis for patients who are less cooperative, such as young children or people with developmental delays who might otherwise need examination under anesthesia or sedation. So back to our case, and these are the two scans that were taken uh, earlier. Uh, our examination found that the injury was Seidel negative, eye pressures were normal, and the anterior chamber was well formed with no peak pupil. But the anterior segment OCT provided us with extra reassurance that the decimates was not compromised, which supported that this was a partial thickness corneal laceration. So this can be a pretty useful tool, especially on call. As for the posterior segment, uh, a fundus exam was impossible in the right eye because of the fibrin. So a B scan was done to rule any obvious vitritis, retinal detachment, or choroidals. And the left eye exam was completely normal, both anterior and posteriorly. So to summarize our case so far, this eight-year-old boy had a partial thickness corneal laceration with severe traumatic iritis from the wooden stick injury. And, but he didn't have a globe rupture as the eye was Seidel negative with no decimase membrane breaks detected on OCT. We started him on Vigamox every hour, PRED four, four times a day, and atropine twice a day. And given that the mechanism of this injury was a wooden stick and that confers the risk of fungal infection, we decided to follow up with him uh, closely in one day. And on follow-up the next day, he notes that the pain had improved, but the vision was unchanged. They were able to use the Vigamox drops every hour and the PRED4 drops four times a day, but they weren't able to obtain the atropine drops. And as you can see in the vision measurement, his right eye, the injured eye, was uh, 2100 that day. So it was slightly worse than the day before. Now, we've all had instances of this happening to our patients, and uh, there's often sh uh, shortages of some topical medications. But in cases of uvi just like this, it's very important to uh, break the posterior synechia as soon as possible. So in pediatric trauma cases like this, once it's established that an EUA is not needed, you should uh, start the pupillary dilation in clinic. And on, on this second visit, the exam here showed a laceration that was unchanged with no infection, a smaller hypopian, central fibrin over the lens, and a clear view of the lens around the fibrin now that the pupil is dilated. And here's a picture of the corneal laceration uh, with uh, surrounding edema on that second day. Uh, there's a fibrin in the AC, as you can see, right in the visual axis and on the anterior lens capsule. And on the right here uh, is a closer look at the laceration. And you can also see that the hypopian has reduced compared to one day ago. And on repeat uh, anterior segment OCT, you can see the laceration in the two cuts of the inferior cornea. So you can see that this one here uh, goes to mid stroma. Uh, and this is in the inferior cornea here. But even more peripherally, inferiorly, you can see it actually goes uh, quite a bit deeper. It goes to the posterior stroma as well. Uh, but in either case, you can see that the decimase membrane is intact. And you can also see that there's uh, some corneal edema here and scar formation as well. As for the fundus exam, there was still no view uh, through with a, a slit lamp um, and a 90 diopter lens or a 20 diopter lens, but 
The B scan showed that the retina is still attached with some vitreous debris inferiorly right here and right here. So on this visit, the corneal laceration was unchanged, but it showed no signs of infection. And the anterior segment inflammation was clinically improving. So we increased the topical steroids to every two hours and decided to follow up the next day. Now, to summarize a couple of uh, visits over the next week, on follow-up the next day, the vision improved to 2050, the laceration was sealed, and the hypopian had completely resolved. So we tapered the Vegamox to every two hours, continued the Predfort every two hours, and the atropine twice a day. Then two days after that, vision stayed stable at 2050, the fibrin resolved as well, and the anterior chamber cells improved to 1+. plus. The lens cleared of the fibrin and the posterior segment was examined to be normal. And so we decided to continue the present management. Two days after that, the vision stayed about the same and anterior chamber cells continued to improve to 0.5 now. So we tapered the Vegamox further and added Tobradex ointment at night and tapered the Predfort to five times a day. At, at this time, um, with every a progressive follow-up visit, the child was feeling pretty comfortable. And at this point, he wasn't voicing any concerns. So we stopped the atropine. And here's what he looked like one week after the injury. You can see inferiorly here that the corneal laceration was sealed uh, with some surrounding edema that's improving and a residual scar. You can also see that the AC reaction uh, is pretty much resolved. There's still uh, trace cells there, but the an uh, anterior chamber fibrin and over the anterior lens capsule have resolved as well. And here the pupil is fully dilated and there's no posterior synechiae, lens damage, or any opacities. The repeat uh, anterior segment OCT shows evolution of healing in the cornea with less corneal edema now. And the hyperreflective areas uh, show the laceration here uh, with some scarring forming around it. Now on follow-up one week later, the child continued to have no visual concerns. However, we can see that the vision is still 2063 in the right eye and 2040 in the left eye. The exam is stable with the healing corneal scar and the anterior chamber is deep and quiet now. And for the posterior segment, um, it was largely normal except for some mild inferior vitreous debris and this is likely spillover from the prior severe uh, anterior chamber reaction rather than an actual vitritis. So at this point, let's stop for a question. Why do you think the vision is still 2060 in the right eye? Does anyone care to take a guess at it? It could be either amblyopia or uh, astigmatism from the laceration. Yes, exactly, exactly. And so we can go over the, the answer choices here. Uh, so um, could it be residual corneal edema? Uh, well, if if the initial injury was uh, affecting the central visual axis of the cornea or closer to it, uh, it could certainly reduce the, uh, the vision there with any corneal edema or residual corneal scarring. However, in our case, the scar and the laceration was very peripheral, so we wouldn't expect it to reduce the vision to 2060. Uh, could it be retinal pathology? It, it could be if the laceration actually ruptured the globe and went deep enough to hit the macula at the back of the eye. Or if it was a closed globe injury, uh, the trauma could have been severe enough to cause commotion involving the macula. Or if there was any associated inflammation that could cause uh, cystomacular edema, that could certainly lower the vision as well. It, it could have been a lens or a vitreous opacity, but in our case, um, as we saw the, uh, the anterior chamber fibrin, over the lens capsule had cleared and uh, the any vitreous opacity was pretty mild. So there wasn't any large vitreous hemorrhage or uh, vitreous inflammation. And we wouldn't expect the vitreous debris that we had in our case to lower the vision in 2060. And as Waleed astutely pointed out, um, uh, amblyopia is certainly something to consider here. And one hint for this is if you paid attention to the visual acuity in the left eye, which was normal and unaffected, that was hovering around 2040 throughout the, the whole time that we followed him. And for an eight-year-old boy, we wouldn't normally expect that. We would expect it to be better.
So we refracted him, and he was found to have high hyperopia with moderate astigmatism in both eyes. So in the right eye, his refraction was 5.75, and in the left eye, it was 5.25. So at this point, the eye was healed well from the corneal laceration and the traumatic uveitis, but we also uncovered that he has hyperopia with likely amyotropic amblyopia in both eyes. So at this point, content with how he healed, we stopped his antibiotics and atropine, started tapering his steroid, and arranged follow-up in six weeks to reassess the hyperopia with a cycloplegic refraction. And on the six-week follow-up, uh, he continued to have no uh, eye concerns, and he's finished all his drops. And on the cycloplegic re refraction, it actually uncovered even more hyperopia in both eyes. He was plus seven uh, in both eyes there. And so to summarize, um, he, he has high hyperopic amyotropic amblyopia in both eyes, and this refractive error was unrelated to the trauma, which has healed pretty well. Uh, the child here was an immigrant, and no one had examined his eyes previously. So we prescribed glasses corresponding to his subjective refraction and recommended follow-up with the local optometrist to continue with managing the amblyopia and monitoring it. And then uh, so far, this was his last visit to date with us. So there's some take-home points uh, from this grand rounds. Um, in the cases of trauma with possible corneal perforation, anterior segment OCT is a helpful adjunctive test. It's a valuable imaging modality in children who might be uncooperative with a slit lamp exam. And in our case, it helped with decision-making and uh, avoided performing an EUA, uh, which is uh, pretty, pretty remarkable because uh, uh, of the risk that anesthesia can come with. Also, in these cases of trauma, once you've decided that you can manage this case without surgery, uh, it's important to use initial treatment with frequent antimicrobial therapy and pupil dilation. And then uh, addition of topical steroids once, uh, once the eye has been covered with antibiotics for at least 24 hours to treat the severe anterior chamber inflammation. And lastly, it's important to pay attention to the normal eye and the refraction of the patient. And to always remember to consider any other pathologies, including any undisclosed amblyopia in pediatric patients as a cause for the reduced vision. So with that, I thank you all for your attention. And just wanted to say a special thank you to my co-resident, Sonia, and my staff, Dr. Tirani, for their guidance with this case. And also to the other co-residents who helped to manage this case at SickKids, uh, Dr. Sabah Samad, Mohaned Almadi, Ryan Mason, and Jenny Ma. So we'll open the floor up to any questions. Thank you, Brian. That was, that was wonderful. And I think I was going to make the point that you made at the end, which was I, I can imagine a scenario where, you know, it's very difficult to, to examine this kid at the slit lab. Um, and, you know, you see a partial thickness laceration, you're not sure. And there's certainly a world where this kid's getting an EUA. Um, and, you know, there's risks to that as well. Um, and so the anterior cyclosis really changed his management here. Um, and made a great impact on on him and and, and then the resources uh, that were saved as a result of not needing an EOA. So that's fantastic. Um, uh, that's a fantastic example. Thank you. So thanks, Brian. It's there's a lot of um, there are a lot of things that we managed to do in SickKids just because we've got really great imaging um, technologies who help us and with. Uh, attention and with a bit of patience, you can actually get a lot of things done in kids. So in fact, children can tolerate um, OCT much better than they can do a bright light on a slit lamp or a direct examination. So that's really, really useful. Um, even in uh, patients who've got um, uh, nystagmus, imaging can be very useful in terms of adding that in your armamentorium in terms of being able to um, image a child and be able to get a still image that you can look at. So this seems pretty mundane, it's, but it's things that you need to sort of keep in, time, in, in mind in terms of what you can do for pediatric patients. And I think it, we keep hammering the point about refracting children, paying attention to the eye that's not involved and kind of thinking, because you, you can very easily just not exact, check the vision in the other eye. And that does happen, unfortunately, far too frequently and not checking refraction. So I'm, I'm sure Kamya will be very happy to type plug this point again and again.
this this needs to be done for all the kids that you see. Um, it's unfortunate because this kid was eight years old and it's impossible now to kind of affect a recovery for his vision at this point. So earlier um, screening examinations would have actually picked this up for this kid and he would have um, better vision outcome. But at least, uh, you know, you can at, at least sort of provide him with uh, glasses uh, for protection and for at least improving his vision somewhat. The other thing I want to say is if you see kids that have got high hyperopia, uh, one of the things that can happen, they can, of course, present with esotropia as a result of significant um, uh, convergence and accommodation that uh, accom accommodation and the convergence that goes with that. So they can present with accommodative esotropia, but some don't do that. They prefer to go in a blur, their eyes are straight, and nobody picks up that they've got a refractive error. One of the things that um, I was told and I sort of now look for it is that kids that are hyperopic always seem to go around in a frown because they're trying to accommodate to see better. So if you see that sign in kids, pay attention to it. It may be that they've got an uncorrected refractive error um, and that might be a helpful pickup. Kamiar's got his hand up. Yes, yeah, sorry I'm mobile, so I apologize if there's a bit of background noise. But I just want to say, well done. First of all, that's a great result. The only comment I would make is that in these cases of trauma where you're specifically worried about maybe fungal um, and you see fibrin and hypopian, it's probably okay to delay starting steroids um, just that little bit longer. So in the first 24 hours, just giving the hourly uh, vigor marks um, would probably still improve things whilst you wait to ensure there's nothing else going on. For example, if you have some cultures coming back. Um, so I think great results. So you can't argue with that. But just in the off chance that you are really worried about the fungal, it probably would have been okay to delay the steroids uh, a, a day or two. I mean, uh, it's, it's, a, it's really unknown whether you... Um, you know exactly what to do with steroids in these circumstances, but I think it would have been fair enough to do that as well. Um, but as things out worked out really well, you know, did perfect. That was just a comment. I don't know if Asim is around to comment whether he would he would uh, sort of uh, play safe as well or not. I think he did actually get uh, just antibiotics over the first twenty four hours and with dilation and and as he improved, then the steroids were added. Um, so he, he'd had hourly antibiotics overnight um, until it came next day and steroids were added. Mm -hmm. But you, fair point, you could delay a little bit longer um, for two days. So, Asam, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Kamiar, the 24 hours. Um, the other thing is, is that on the OCT, you have to be very careful because this is a long oblique cut. So this still could have gone into the eye at some point. And this could have been an intraocular case. So there's one cut that shows it, but then the other cuts later on shows that it's a very deep, like within 150 microns of the decimase. So this could have definitely have gone in and you need a scan, two things. You need a number of different scans to cover the whole area. It's really hard when you take a single cut because that picture is from the spectralis. So that's a single scan through one point. And definitely near the limbus, this could have gone into the eye and even gone posteriorly. It would be very hard to tell at the original presentation. So I think anterior semi OCT is wonderful. I use it all the time, but you have to get that. Uh, a series of Im images, and they should be at right angles to the, um, to the wound. So the pictures that were shown show a horizontal cut, which is just oblique to the actual incision. If you do vertical, you get a better sense of the true depth Otherwise, you kind of end up missing it. Now, it may have been difficult. It's hard. Obviously, I wasn't there. This kid was uncomfortable. But if there was enough um, concern in his case, especially if there was a, a potential with the vitreous um, abnormalities, there you know may have been a case here to consider taking him to the OR to be 100% sure because they've been wrong. Um, the other point was uh, Brian talked about Seidel. Um, Seidel uh, is not positive if your chamber is flat or if there's something blocking it. So we just recently had a trauma at SickKids where the child was Seidel negative, 
but actually had a collapsing AC. And because there wasn't enough fluid, or you can get a one-way valve phenomenon too. So if you have a very small opening, it'll only come in with pressure. And it's harder in a kid to, uh, you get epithelial growth, it's very aggressive. So you have to be very careful in these borderline cases. You know, I've seen a lot of trauma that is full thickness that masquerades as being not so full thickness. And the last, the last point I'm going to make, and I'll, I'll be done after this, I'm very glad that no one put a suture in this. So okay, this is a point that Camier and myself both make, was partial thickness lacerations. This case did much better. You got a much better visual result than if you actually put a suture into this. And the corneal edema for the residents, the corneal edema actually decreased, and the wound was perfectly aligned. And if you had gone in and tried to suture this, it would have been you know, worse no matter who was doing it. So I, I, it wasn't mentioned, but I, it was a very good point in the management that nothing was done with the actual wound. It was just left alone, and it healed beautifully. So I think the important part is really paying attention and closely following up. And so this kid was seen daily. Um, so it's, it's also, there is your empiric management. If you see things are getting worse, you've got to go in. Okay, so you've got to change your tag. If they're improving, then you know that you're on the right track and what, you, what you're doing is fine. And it's uh, particularly um, to your point in not actually trying to suture things. So uh, if, you, if you can, and if you can follow the patient appropriately, if you can do your imaging, try and stay out of the eye. But if it's getting worse, you have to have a very low threshold for going in and uh, doing any UA. So don't let that stop you as long as you can actually see the patient frequently enough. Okay, and on that note, we will um, come to a close, but I wanna thank Brian, Sonia, and Dr. Tarani for wonderful presentations this morning. I thought that was a really uh, well done grand rounds. I hope everyone enjoys their long weekend, or not the long week, sorry, enjoys their weekend, and I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.